Hello, my name is Kathleen Carroll, Chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I'm honored to welcome you, our very special guest, to this conversation about press freedom. Tonight, four amazing people are joining us. Let me introduce them. First, Dapo Olorunyomi, founder and CEO of Nigeria's Premium Times and the Premium Times Center for Investigative Journalism a heroic man who has devoted his life to journalism that holds the powerful to account and the freedoms that enable that work. Welcome, Dabo. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Patrick Gaspard, president of the Open Foundation, I'm sorry, the Open Society Foundations and the chair of the International Press Freedom Awards program you just saw. Patrick has spent his life working on social justice issues in a variety of positions, including at the White House, and as US ambassador to South Africa in the Obama administration. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Kathleen. And Lester Holt, anchor of the NBC Nightly News and Dateline NBC, a hardworking CPJ board member and host of our 2020 International Press Freedom Awards program. Lester is no desk bound anchor. He is constantly reporting from the field and is a tireless champion of the journalists who toil to bring stories and truth to their audiences. Welcome, Lester. Thank you, Kathleen. And we are waiting, as I can see him signing on, Shahid, Shahidul Alam, founder of, among other things, the Drick Picture Library. Shahidul is a noted photographer, storyteller, and a guru to the many photojournalists he has trained and inspired in Bangladesh and beyond. There you are. Hello, Shahidul. How nice to see you. Great. I was going to ask you the, um, the first question, because tonight what we're going to do is imagine that we are all together in a comfortable place, in comfortable chairs, possibly mm -hmm. with a, a beverage of our choice, just having a conversation. We are going to be the anti-Zoom meeting group. Okay. Shahidul, if you are ready, I'd like to start with you, if I might, just to have you. Oh. Is Please that all right? See. Is how coronavirus give, give is a little bit more light. Oh, okay. How people are growing. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to start with Dapo while you're getting yourself situated. How's that? I Dapo, your acceptance speech taught, had a very potent way of connecting the work that journalists do and the societies that they live in. And you've like often spoken about how a free press is essential for democracies to grow because a free press helps societies identify problems so they can be solved. I, I wonder if you have a specific example that you could talk about a time when journalism really did help identify a problem or find a solution. This idea of... Well, uh, thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, I think the history of Nigeria itself provides uh, the backdrop for this kinds of expression. Um, our media uh, helped to make the case for independence in the 60s. No doubt, there's no way you read Nigeria's history today, uh, front and center. Uh, a good place has been given to the role of uh, the founding fathers of our modern press. Uh, the country also went into a bloody civil war, which claimed about two million lives. Uh, our journalism was also generally now being credited for laying the basis for the kind of consensus that built uh, unity after that war. But I think the most significant moment for uh, journalism had been uh, the period of those touchy, crazy years of uh, military autocracy in this country. Uh, and no way you can write the history of return to democracy in Nigeria without putting the press uh, as in the front rank. And uh, as we proceed in our fourth republic today, uh, the biggest uh, advocate, the biggest uh, push for the anti-corruption, which has really wrecked the image and reputation of Nigeria, has been uh, Nigeria's journalism. So without doubt, uh, I think uh, no way you can uh, characterize uh, the Nigerian story without giving a very noble place to uh, journalism, in spite of all its own failings and all its own difficulties. Uh, it's one of the most noble institutions and pillars of uh, in the making of uh, in Nigeria of today. 
you know, I think we all needed to hear something like that somebody uh, from someone with your uh, courage and your long view of what journalism can do for a, for a country. And so we thank you for that. Shai Dool, I, I, I wonder if I could talk with you a little bit about um, how you balance the normal and natural fear you might have. You talked about being, uh, it, when you've been arrested, you were worried about being killed, very legitimately worried about being killed. And, and, and the story you tell about being in your flat two years ago, um, when it, were, it was broken into and you were trying to resist and screaming, it's a harrowing story. And yet you constantly are putting yourself on the front lines. How do you balance that fear with your passion for what you do? I was literally sitting exactly where I'm sitting now. Oh my gosh. This is what we do. Um, sure, there is fear, but that, that has to do with reality. Uh, I, I think one needs to recognize what that reality is. But for me, uh, what gives me other strength is that I see myself as a part of the community, a much bigger community of which I am a very small part. And I think while I was in jail and while I did suffer, I think they suffered a lot more. And often we forget when, when we celebrate people who are in jail, have been victimized, we forget what the people outside have to go through at a time like this. Mm -hmm. We also forget that while I'm a prominent journalist and I'm supported by people like you and people across the globe, there are people all across the country in Bangladesh and in many other countries whose lives are at peril who do not make it to the headlines, who do not uh, have CPJ awards and who do not get any of this attention. And they're the ones we need to fight for. So I don't really see this as something for myself. And I see the pain as a collective pain and the struggle as a collective struggle. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Patrick, um, when you were an ambassador, uh, I assume one of the things that you had to talk about the governments that you dealt with was uh, honoring press freedoms and the, the kinds of values that you just heard Dapo and Shaidul talk about. And I wonder if you feel there that those are lost now uh, in the United States, that its primacy, its influence is lost. Uh, CPJ is just this week release some recommendations to the Biden administration to try and begin to restore that. But do you feel that it's gone forever or are you hopeful? Well, you know, first, Kathy, let me say it's just an extraordinary honor to be on this panel uh, with you, Lester Holt, and our two extraordinary uh, honorees. You know, um, uh, I'll say uh, in a nonpartisan way uh, that in the last uh, four years, we've had a bit of a values vacation uh, as it relates to press freedom and human rights uh, uh, litigated through the U.S. State Department, national security, uh, and most especially through uh, our White House. There's a way that the rhetoric of the uh, current administration and their attacks levied against American uh, U.S.-based press uh, has been picked up and replicated and amplified uh, in the idiom of autocrats who have taken their lead from uh, the U.S. president. Furthermore, there's a way that um, the U.S. has been a reliable partner in infrastructures like uh, the, the work through Voice of America uh, to lift up the critical question of uh, uh, the importance of independent media as a bulwark in our uh, democracies. Uh, as Lester said in uh, his introduction of tonight's uh, if, a virtual event, uh, media sometimes is what stands between all of us and the slide into confusion. So there's profound concern. Uh, about uh, the general slide into confusion uh, and the fact-free world that we uh, find ourselves living in uh, right now. However, um, everything uh, lost need not be lost uh, forever. Uh, there is a tremendous appetite um, around the world, uh, certainly uh, with um, uh, my friends in South Africa, the diplomats that I found myself engaged in uh, throughout uh, the African continent. There's a real appetite for the U.S. to re-enter uh, into uh, the question of media freedom and to lend its voice and protection of the uh, of uh, the, the Dapos, the Shahadul's of uh, this world. Uh, there are important recommendations that uh, CPJ makes uh, in its white paper, uh, and I think that uh, it's important to really press the case on them. But it's also hugely important through a diplomatic corps, through um, uh, our uh, structures, 
to make sure that we are deepening uh, uh, partnerships here. When I served as US ambassador to South Africa, I discovered uh, much to my consternation that there were still apartheid era laws on the books in South Africa that allowed the government to apply too wide a definition to national interest uh, in a way that enabled them to censor, to shut down uh, uh, independent, uh, uh, the, the ability uh, to have independent voice. Uh, and that's a, a thing that is threatening in any uh, democracy. We have to lean into these questions and lift up partnership and we have to uh, invest meaningfully uh, in um, uh, a, d a different course of action. So everything uh, lost is not lost forever. Uh, and this is a moment of real reset in the world. Well, that's, uh, that's a hopeful note. Uh, although you're precisely right that the, the vaguest words in the English language are national security or national interests, which can be interpreted widely, alas. Um, Lester, I wonder if I could ask you to talk a little bit about your own personal passion for this issue. I mean, you, you spent a lot of time in the field as well as anchoring an incredibly important news program. Was there a particular incident or pattern that crystallized this issue for you? I wouldn't say a particular incident. Um, I think like a lot of people, uh, you know, I came up in the, in the 70s and really started reporting in earnest in the, in the 80s. Um, I think it was a time you thought of press freedom issues as being somewhere over there um, yeah. overseas. Yeah. I have certainly worked in, in countries without a free press, uh, you know, reported from um, North Korea and Iran and Iraq under Saddam Hussein and was you know, briefly detained in, in Egypt and uh, had uh, equipment confiscated. But, but I always thought you, you kind of accepted on some level, not accepted, but understood uh, overseas. Um, you know, I listened to Amal Clooney tonight in her remarks, and she said she was motivated by anger. And I, th I think that kind of describes where I am right now. Some of those images we showed at the beginning of tonight's program of reporters, um, you know, being targeted with tear gas, um, at least two of them were my colleagues, uh, people that, that work with me. And I think there is a, a sense of anger and, 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 you know, to see that in our country and to see us having to fight you know, these sorts of, of abuses, um, it's symptomatic of something larger. Um, but I think, I, I hope that those images, the way we're able to cover them now, it will kind of bring people to the table to understand not only what's happening against the press, but what the larger threat is. And I think of some of the stories of our time, even right now, as we watch the post-election, imagine, I want people to imagine that story playing out without a free and independent press to talk about the truth, to, to separate fact from fiction, to try to quash the rumors. Um, so many stories of our time. And I think that, I think one of our challenges is to kind of re-educate people about who we are, why we do what we do, and what the world and life would be like you know, without people that could stand up and be champions of the truth. People talk about bias and I said, damn right I have a bias, I have a bias toward the truth. Um, to, to factual storytelling. Um, that should be our message. One of our other uh, press freedom winners, Svetlana Prokopayeva, uh, said something in her acceptance remark that really resonates for both, uh, uh, for everyone, I think all of us in this conversation. She said, in today's Russia, many officials, including prosecutors and judges, do not understand the journalist's mission or why we need freedom of speech. And I would say that that extends in many countries to just average citizens who, who uh, as Lester just said, we've lost our trust. Um, Babo, you, you have been such a fierce advocate for a free press. How do you convince, if you're not just battling the government, how do you convince average people of the value of a free press? What are those conversations like? Well, uh, sometimes it can be a bit abstract uh, here, no doubt about it. But uh, I mean, one can start from the uh, central question of um, why are things getting wrong? Um, why should we live like this? Why should our country 
be so tired in this kind of image? Why 60 years after independence with just enormous wealth in this country? Mm -hmm. Why are we such in a rickety shape? Uh, why are institutions failing? Why suddenly Nigeria used to be, you know, uh, the heartland of a great judiciary? Why is it all falling apart? And, you know, people can easily purchase justice. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I was growing up at a time that you, you saw all the professors and so on. You all wanted to look like these people. Suddenly, all our schools are now broken. And um, you, you got to link it that somebody needs to, to speak for society. And you have to be able to demonstrate that uh, without a free press. Indeed, uh, democracy is impossible. Good society is impossible. Uh, development is impossible. Uh, this is the case we make always. And I think people get it a little bit because once you are on this straight and uh, uh, correct path, uh, autocracy in one way or the illiberal states that uh, we have in this country over the years uh, come after you. So people can connect it between what you're doing and uh, uh, I mean, we just went through one month of a very terrible uh, protest against a, a terrible police culture here. Um, and people can see that, you know, with government lying, making a case, in fact, joining the terrible disinformation campaign again. So, yeah, I mean, people invariably get to understand, but often too, that uh, the government is able to. Uh, to make a case against the press, but they never win for too long because people don't get it. Yeah. Can we talk for a little bit about local journalism, which is where, uh, which is one of the most endangered uh, kinds of journalism uh, everywhere. Shahidul, you have spent the last 30 years uh, planting seeds in communities uh, around the region, particularly encouraging visual journalists, which have their own particular danger. But I'd like to hear you talk about what you see as the future of local journalism, given all the pressures, given the importance of it in a community's life. How is, how is it, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Oh, can, you're muted, Ashaido. Uh, I am optimistic, uh, <laughs> primarily because uh, we're a people who love democracy and freedom. There's this great tradition. This country was born from a fight to speak our own language and students and intellectuals have played such a vibrant role throughout our history to give us what we have. Um, what is problematic for me today is the media itself uh, has to a large extent abdicated except for notable exceptions. Uh, the media in place of being the fourth estate has become a spokesperson uh, for, for the government, uh, and that becomes problematic. In the film, uh, you might have seen me wearing a Julian Assange t-shirt, uh, and while Lester was talking about it, it's important to recognize that governments which speak about democracy and freedom uh, and espouse it in their rhetoric, when it comes close to home, suddenly takes a very different uh, impression. But the converse of that is we have a people who do love democracy, and while there was a whole globe of people campaigning for me outside, it was people inside the country who took far bigger risks to be on the streets, to campaign, to never give up, which gives me that hope. And I think we have problems because technology can be abused uh, and is being abused. All these governments talk of fake news. I think the biggest proponent of fake news is the government in most cases. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it is the people who have taken it on board and who are subverting the system. And I think over a period of time, when all of us become journalists of a sort, it'll be far more difficult to cap. Can I, can I add one thing to, to that, if that's okay, Kathleen, to, to share adults, uh, comments there? I think, um, uh, of course, uh, there's a great threat from, uh, from autocrats. There's a great threat from uh, the new way that uh, the media ecosystem is designed uh, because of social, social media. So there's a real threat to local journalism. But can I also say that the other threat that exists here is um, a threat that comes from a lack of innovation uh, on behalf of those who work in uh, local uh, independent media. 
Maria Ressler. Maria Ressler was just uh, interviewing Amal Clooney. Maria Ressler is, is uh, an extraordinary leader, not just because of her courage, but because of her ability to innovate. If you look at uh, the direction of travel for Rappler, how they've taken advantage of the new media uh, and uh, the way uh, the vast majority of people are now receiving and socializing information in their lives. Maria understood that there's an entirely different way to build networks, to build a uh, community, uh, and that it was incumbent upon her and her colleagues in Rappler to make that transition. Regrettably, and I can say this as an organization uh, that uh, works in partnership with independent media around the world, uh, too many uh, brave, smart, courageous uh, editors, publishers, uh, journalists have to be dragged kicking and screaming into 21st uh, century uh, innovations in how we communicate. Uh, and that can't be lost on any of us as we think about what a reset looks like. That's really, that's really true. I, um, Lester and Shahidul, both of you um, have spent your careers in a visual medium. And that has been, it's very powerful. Video can take you there, a camera can take you there. A still picture freezes a moment and, and allows an intimacy with the news that didn't exist before we had cameras. They do present particular dangers, however, to journalists in the field because it's, it, they're, they're more easily targeted. And uh, there's a new danger on the horizon and that is the um, degree um, of fakery in video, you can, you know, there's a lot of mischief going on uh, with computers and and images. How do you see the? How do you see the, us being able to navigate that particular? Uh, it's um, you know, there's a there's been such a democratization of on the technical side of equipment that you know our professional network equipment looks kind of like you know consumer equipment sometimes. <laughs> Um, so it, in many ways, it makes our job easier that we, you know, we sometimes can conceal or not have as, as big a footprint, um, a lower profile in, in some of the situations that we, we saw this evening. Um, but the fakery is a huge issue. I mean, we control a lot of our content with you know, our, our crews and our photographers, but a lot of, of course, uh, things that get reported start on the internet with, with images and uh, you know, we we spend an awful lot of time making sure that that what is being shared on the internet, what is creating the story, that we can verify. Um, and if we can't, that we can be transparent. I think that the larger question is: it's never been more important for us to be transparent in what we do and how we do it. That we let people into the process to kind of start trying to rebuild that trust, to understand that that we don't, unlike you know, sometimes the citizen journalists. Um, you know, we have to go through a few more steps uh, before we, we put something on the air. And I think that's, that's got to be part of our, um, uh, how we re-educate the public about the importance um, of a free and independent press and that we do have, you know, checks uh, to make sure that what we're putting on, you know, we can verify, we can tell you where it came from, we can, you know, tell you what it means. I mean, so much of what we see anymore you know it's, it's through a, a soda straw it's a very narrow image of something and our our, our challenge is to you know broaden uh, that lens up as i, as I uh, mix my, my metaphors but to, to broaden that view out and to help people understand how things are seen and how we can put them in some kind of a context okay. and shahidu well, how do you see this yeah well yeah. device is what i do a lot of my work with today uh, i mean i i wow. remember in 2010, uh, I was doing interviews of the police who had blockaded our gallery using a flip, which was a $35 camera at that time. But I think, um, you know, if we talk of fake news or whatever, we forget that it's always been there. I think Lewis Hine talked about in the early 1900s, said something very interesting. He said, while photographs may not lie, liars may take photographs. Mm -hmm. And like they can be presidents and can be evangelists, can be uh, advertising people. Uh, I think the mistake we make is putting our trust in the medium as opposed to the source. And at the end of the day, the veracity of the source is the only thing that we can rely upon. And that requires building trust, that requires establishing, establishing credibility, and it doesn't happen overnight. It happens because you've walked that walk for a very, very long time 
and people know if so and so is saying it, I can believe it. Not because of what's being said, but because so and so is saying it. And I think we need to turn it around. So it's not the photograph or the video that we trust, it's who the storyteller is. And whatever tool they might use, whether it's words, whether it's pictures, uh, whether it's whatever new tool might come up on the horizon, at the end of the day, we need to be questioning constantly, questioning not only the medium, but also the source and ensuring that the source is credible. That is the only thing we have to live by. Well, each of you seem uh, a good deal more optimistic than, than others may feel on any given day. I think that's a really remarkable thing. Patrick, let me just ask you, um, quickly to build on your on the point you were making about the global view you have of independent media and how you support it. You know, um, Amal Clooney was angry, but she also ended up being optimistic. Um, do you share that view? Do you share her optimism? Uh, I, I think, uh, Kathleen, that it's impossible to be engaged in uh, the work of truth telling, the work of democracy building, the work of uh, uh, investing in the architecture of uh, freedom, uh, if you're not optimistic, if you don't uh, believe uh, the, the, that old notion that the arc of the moral universe bends in a particular way. Uh, I do, uh, so I share an optimism, but uh, I think uh, that it's incumbent upon all of us to try to sometimes impose our will on that arc uh, and, uh, and to uh, put our thumb a, a bit on the scales and that requires advocacy, it requires strategic investment, uh, and it requires um, the ability to be bold uh, in how uh, we speak out. And we all of us have to remember, uh, as um, uh, George Orwell uh, noted, that uh, press freedom uh, is fundamentally about uh, the ability for uh, citizens uh, to not only build account, uh, but to hold up uh, their singular voices. Uh, and that is, at the end of the day, uh, a notion um, that uh, people matter, their uh, agency uh, is what should really inform the direction uh, of our uh, governance. Uh, and for me, um, uh, I'm always gonna put my faith uh, in um, the ability of people to ultimately, maybe not in the first instance, maybe not in the second instance, uh, but to ultimately um, adhere to some set of basic uh, uh, values oriented around um, truth telling uh, compassion uh, and uh, a, a desperate need that all of us have to uh, be uh, connected um, uh, at, at, at the core um, uh, to uh, a set of uh, kind of shared uh, understanding uh, of um, uh, things that we can like truly rely on in order to take care of our uh, communities. Uh, journalism, uh, press freedom is critical uh, to that. Uh, and I'm always going to be uh, kind of bullish uh, on uh, my sense that uh, this is something that people uh, are willing uh, to fight for. The Dapo and Sharon Dole are remarkable individuals, uh, but their success, their ultimate success, um, isn't uh, theirs alone. Both of them would tell you that it's taken a, co a courageous community uh, to um, shore up and buttress uh, their practice, uh, their freedoms, uh, and um, we're all going to need to be able to kind of continue to draw on that uh, reservoir of community courage. So yes, I'm, I'm radically uh, optimistic, uh, Kathleen. Well, it's hard to imagine that we'll have a better closing line than being radically optimistic. And I can't imagine that we would have been any better served by, and we have two of them, the giants of press freedom and our winners here, Dapo and Chai Duel. And they have been at it for a very, very, very long time. They have been incredibly successful and they stand as an inspiration to, to all of us who are in this conversation. I thank you very much for joining us, both of you, as particularly since the time is punishing where you are. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Lester. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, Patrick, for the support that OSF gives us and your eloquence on the issue. Dapo, thank you for your leadership and Shahidul for your um, firebrand, fist in the air attitude about this issue that's so important. And I thank you to all of you who joined us in this special conversation. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you very much. And be radically optimistic. <laughs>